I turned back towards the lake. Fog drifts across empty stagnant waters, as menacing as when I first laid eyes on it. I can't bear to tear my eyes from the sight. It's as though reality halts and I stare deeply at the surface. I shake away the sensation. I'm alive. I've made it across. And now I'll be able to unite the villagers and remove the brigaders. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. And welcome to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Death by Pony. Today we're hopping back in the Lake of Voices. Without further ado, let's hop in. Did you think it was over? He doesn't answer immediately. When he does, the reply is accompanied by him uh, grasping himself like he might fall apart if he lets go. Yeah, I did. That would have been the normal outcome for his situation. Alone, lightless. I shouldn't have asked. I must have let a frown slip, though, through, because Lou smiles a non-smile. He stretches his hand behind his neck and gives a little chuckle. Something really is wrong with me. Somehow, I feel lighter. The whispers in the lake, which had already grown, now speak faster and clearer. The individual worlds are almost audible. I'd likely be able to make them out if I knew the Nixie language. For a slit second, I wish I did. Light in the distance still drifts along the same manner as it did when we first started walking, which I take to mean the path hasn't turned so far. Hopefully that means we're still on the right path. But the light, it got brighter. It's strong enough that I have to glance away for a second, and the next time I look, the light has grown. The bridge is on fire. Luke grabs... I grab Lou's arm without thinking. He's standing there, stiff, staring at the glow, eyes dull. We're going to run. To hell with the guide's order. If we don't go now, we'll never go anywhere again. Lou doesn't respond. I give his arm a small tug and he appears to come to himself and he nods at me. I make the decision then that I won't let go of his arm. I don't know what'll happen to him if I do. We take off, the heat growing with each step. The darkness of the bridge means that the fire is spreading slowly, but it makes me question how it began in the first place. There's no end to how wrong this place is. It takes 20 paces before the air around us ripples, then starts folding into itself. Thick smoke pours over us, stinging like scorpions at my eyes. I cover my mouth with my free arm, then breathe, and soon we're at the fire itself. The bridge lurches beneath us as the beans supporting it are starting to give way. To the thousands of fly, flying sparks, Lou stumbles and pulls against me for support. We keep our ground. I start pulling him through the blaze. We don't have time to gather our bearings. Who knows what we'll have, how long we have until the bridge collapses or is devoured by flames. We keep our pace racing across the bridges, but there's no sign of the guide anywhere. I begin to fear that we may never be able to catch up with him. I know how quickly he moves, and Lou keeps nearly falling as we make our way past the flames. I tighten my grip on him and we push those thoughts out of and I push those mush thoughts out of my mind. I just need to keep moving forward. We will make it out of here. I keep down the path, the flames so gradually gnawing at the flanks beneath us. The guide doesn't turn up nor do any sides of him. We push on. We will not stop moving. Then we do. The bridge comes to a dead end of rotted outboards, collapsed into the lake. For a moment, our breathing stops at once. If this was the way that led to the island, then... I flip back to face Lou, my expression unaffected. I'm not going to allow panic to sap us of our judgment. Let's look for another bridge. I resolutely begin retracing our path. He follows without protest. Our resignation is silent, except for our footfalls and the snapping of soggy wood attempting to burn. We frequently have to step over smoldering sections, trying to come alight. At one point, we even have to walk one at a time sideways to avoid widely flickering small fire billowing out black smoke. Just as my spirit begins to dim, we come across a different section to take. Among all the forks, there are only two that aren't collapsed or consumed by fire to risk following. Lou's gaze is flickering down either path. There's a palpable sense of anxiety coming from him. I... I don't know. I don't know which way. It's all right. But it's not all right. We have to have something to go off of. Anything at all. A cold sweat trickles down its way down my back. Before either of us can think further, a noise catches my attention. I hastily address Lou. Did you hear that? It came from the right. 
You and I trade looks. This could be the signal we need. But what if it isn't? Do those monsters know how to whistle? Mm. We should go right, I think. To where the sound came from. I'm a little surprised Lou is offering his own opinion. It's good to hear, however. I take a deep breath. I agree. There's more of a chance the whistle was assigned for good over ill. Our course decided we move as one down the right path, no longer hesitating. As we follow the bridge down, there is no sign of end. There's no need to debate between directions again. We start to outpace the fire, one danger thankfully fading away. The night continues to lighten regardless. We glance at the sky and realize what's happening. The sun is rising. The bridge will sink into the water and darkness, the darkness just dis disappearing and taking us with them. We'll be lost. It suddenly seems pointless. We don't even know whether we've gone the right way and we still have and caught up to the guide. We can't outswim the Nixie and we can't outrun the Dawn. We're going to run out of time. Yet we keep moving forward. And finally, our perseverance is rewarded. The silhouette of an island rises in the distance. The island grows rapidly larger, and soon the scent of earth and trees reach us. In spite of the horrors of the night, the dock emerges from the fog before us, welcoming us to safety. We reach the shore. I don't believe it until I've stepped off the wood in my boots sink into the sand. I walk further inland like a corpse, my sole instinct to flee from the waterline. My hazy eyes single in on something ahead. The guide stands uh, an outcropping in the distance, watching like a sentinel. He doesn't even come to greet us. I stare at him for a moment, not even able to feel alarmed at my own lack of feeling about the situation. He uses his staff to gesture to the forest behind him before disappearing between the trees. I can only assume he must be asking me to follow. The guide takes us further inland, more towards the center. There's a view of the coastline from here, but we're also partly obscured by a few trees. It's time to sleep. No one has the energy to argue with him at this moment. I find a place comfortable as one could ask for in a location like this, next to one of the trees further out and lay down, trying to block out my thoughts. For once, exhaustion is my ally, and I s uh, slip off into sleep. My eyes slowly blink open and readjust the brightness, what well, little there is. The sun is obscured by thick layer of fog, making it impossible to estimate the time of day. I prop my elbows and push myself up. The group is, the ground is hard and rocky, but that isn't the only reason my, I am eager to get on my feet. I check my surroundings. The harsh, craggy earth of the island is interlaced with twisting vines and gnarled branches. Beside me, Lou is still fast asleep. The guide, however, is nowhere to be seen. I realize that I don't recall seeing him lay down with everyone. It is likely he left us hours ago. There is a creeping silence here. I can't help but shudder at the hollow ache feeling inside of me. It refuses to relent. I shift my weight back and forth, unsure of what to do with myself. Memories of last night's harrowing journey flicker through my mind. I notice Lou begin to stir. Lou props himself into a sitting position. He doesn't move to rise any further. My mouth opens, then shuts. After a moment of fumbling, a word finally escapes. Hello. No reaction. We should eat something soon. Don't worry about me. I'm fine. I'm not hungry. Lou's back is turned against me. He still hasn't gotten up out of the dirt. You won't make it very far if you don't have something to eat. Lou buries his head deep into his knees as he curls into a tighter ball. No thanks. I don't know what to do. There's a lull of silence between us. A distinct rustle of leaves around catches my attention. The guide appears, emerging from the thicket. Lou doesn't seem to notice as he's still facing away. The Nixie will not tread on land in daylight. However, being near the shoreline is still dangerous. If you leave the center of the island, remain cautious. Before the sun sets, I will be in this area. It would be wise to meet me here before nightfall. I emotionally watched the guide. I consider his piece here fin he considers his piece here finished. The guide turns around and returns to the forest area from which he came. Lou meekly calls to me. I turn around to face him, though I don't speak. He's standing some distance away. He fidgets a glance over the side before returning his gaze to my eyes. He gestures for me to come closer. He begins to whisper at me, but he fumbles with his words and I can't make out anything he says. 
I look at him inquisitively. Finally, he speaks up enough to be clear. I'm sorry for what happened last night. He speaks quickly as he looks up at me, eyes filled with sorrow. He shifts his focus downwards. You would have been better off without me. Do you mean when I had to stay behind? Yes, you got caught up in the fire and it was a disaster. It's all right. Nothing happened in the end. Besides, it isn't your fault that things turned out this way. It was closer to being my fault than anyone else's. I wasn't supposed to be here, and all I did was get in the way. The guide was right about me. I knew from the beginning that it would be like this too. I never should have stayed. Finishing uh, his thought, he sniffles and turns away. Suddenly I feel a strong surge of emotion rip through me. Everything is falling apart. I do not have the power to change this. Quietly, I speak. I speak with the guide. I ball my hands into fists, stealing my will. I start advancing in the direction the guide went. I push my way through the branches and reach the other side of the other shore of the island. I look for the guide, but he's nowhere in sight. How? Where could he have gone? I search the area further without success. The island is not in any way large. If I have not found him, it can only be he does not wish to be found. I sigh as all motivation leaves me. I, th I think I simply need to be alone. It seems as though my wish to be alone will be granted. There's no sign that they will be returning. A cold chill somehow whips its way down my back despite the calm of the air. I keep my gaze on the dark ground, taking a breath so deep it stings the back of my throat. As I steadily empty my lungs, I try to empty my mind of all thoughts. I do not know what I'm doing anymore. Nothing is straightforward. I find something familiar and powerful in my thoughts to latch on. The mission. I have to try and focus on the mission. I need to be strong. My eyes dart back up. Is someone watching? I wonder if I'm afraid of being seen struggling like this, or if, ho if I hope I may not be the only on my own here. It doesn't matter. There's still nothing but the silent island. Time seems so indefinite around me, passing slowly. On the island, it almost seems to move slow as a stagnant pond. I shake my head, bearing the thoughts. It's ir irrational, but I cannot bear to think of uh, even old pond water. Gradually, my consciousness begins to include the world again. I do a few standard warm-up stretches, testing my mind and body. I don't know how long it's been, but I feel I have regained enough of my wits to continue. I need to make sure everything is alright. I head through the wooded part of the island. There isn't anything that could be called a path, but I managed to pick my way through the brush bush quite well. Through the thinner strands of trees, I briefly catch sight of the guide standing in one of the beaches. He seems fine, but even though I'm sure he turned his head towards me, he makes no show of acknowledging me. I continue to check without heeding that. I find that I've been pacing back and forth for quite some time. I finished my check a few a while ago, so now I've nothing left to do but aimlessly wander. I'm overcome with restlessness. This island may be safer than the bridges, but that is far from enough to ease my mind. I quietly sigh and decide on waiting on my own. If I go back now, however, I will in, will I whoever I encounter will know I don't want to be alone. That is more troubling than simply staying where I am. I sit down and silently listen to the ambience of the island and wait for time to pass. I can only hope this will all end before I can no longer keep myself together. The sun begins to descend in the sky and the light starts to fade into the fog. I feel relieved that it's almost time to leave. This island, a chill slips down my spine at the thought of what comes next, however. It isn't too long before I hear someone approaching from within the bush. Brush. It's the guide. He emerges from the bushes and steps out into the open. Hello. He doesn't respond to my greeting. Instead, he narrows his eyes, causing the tension to rise that much further. Lou is gone. He's dead. I nearly fall backwards from his words. What? A second ticks by and the guide says nothing as my panic pounds higher, harder, and takes full control of my mind. This is not possible. No, this is a mistake. We have to go look for him. I would not claim this without good reason. Wait and you'll see. Night will fall and Lou will not come to meet us. 
We are the only two remaining. I do sink down to the ground at that. All my thoughts, the sound of my breath coming in and out at my very heartbeat forming two letters. No. No, no. I cut my hands against my head. Why? I look up at the towering, stoic face of the guide, begging for an explanation. Something. Anything. But this. He gives no comfort. My tears start and stop for a moment to the next. M with my wild, tumultuous emotions, I am in brutal agony, bawling my eyes out and shouting indecipherably. Then I am feeling nothing, laying in a cool void where everything seems inconsequential and so far away from me. Vimele, Margaret, Lou. The heartbeat comes back. I have failed. I failed them. I failed every single one of them. I couldn't help anyone. I stiffen back. I sniff back deeply, tears falling down my face once more. I manage a small miracle. I stand. The guide says nothing. I'm left with just my own thoughts and the heartbeat softly drumming as we wait for the torturous bridges to surface. I lean against a tree, slowly reminding myself how to walk again as time runs by too fast, dragging on too slow. A blanket of stars slowly creeps over the horizon as the day truly descends into night. I still hold on to a desperate, unreasonable flicker of hope that eventually Lou will appear through the bushes, ready to continue the journey. He never does. My hope is blown out by the wind rushing across the lake. Suddenly, there's a gurgling. The water parts as the bridges of Sinlos rise, powered by some unnatural force, creaking like they might fall apart. We walk onto the wide open shore. I feel an inexplicable pounding like a hammer in the back of my head, uh, beating faster and heavier than my own heart. I clench my teeth to stop it from turning my stomach. The guide is quick to return to the bridges, making haste towards them, then gets my attention. The island is no longer safe now that the sun has set. We must leave. I understand what he's saying. Still, I turn my attention to the lake. For a moment, I listen to the near silence of the water, sealing myself for what is to come. Then I place my feet firmly onto the dock. Against what any natural instinct would advise me, I have returned to the misty labyrinth of bridges. I tried to synchronize my inhalations with my footfalls to steady my breathing. The guide and I make no attempts to converse with one another. We are as quiet as the lake we are crossing. It feels as though barely any time has passed when I realize that half the night has crept by. We encountered a few second bridges which forced us to reroute, while other paths were rotten enough to make us stagger our steps. However, the biggest threat of all eerily absent, the Prowlers. I haven't seen more than shadowy glimpses of them down other paths, and even those may have simply been tricks of the fog. I feel I may be even more on edge tonight than the last. I ponder whether they're still weary from cons the consuming blaze of the night yesterday, or if they are less dragging themselves across the bridges than usual because they have already gotten what they wanted. My skin crawls at the touch of icy fingers at the thought, and I can't control the sharp shiver that travels down my spine. I look ahead towards the guide pensively before coming to a decision. Where might the prowlers be? He doesn't respond. Perhaps he didn't hear me? I debate whether to repeat my question or not before he suddenly replies. Allowing others to die is an easy path to follow. It is keeping them alive that makes it so difficult for one to cross Sinlos. That isn't an answer to my question. His vagueness feels intentional. His avoidance doesn't stop the horrifying realization from coming to my mind. I still live because they died. This, this isn't right. I try to swallow, but my mouth is a desert. It shouldn't have happened like this. I promised I would protect everybody, not benefit from, from their deaths. Every step on the damp wood, my feet feel more like lead. I feel the weight of them on my feet, like I'm dragging the remains with me, as they wonder why we could not help them. My body moves unbidden, unable to stop, even with my thoughts and tatters, the notion that something might still be out there, that's 
All of this could come to an end. Calls me onwards. After hours of navigating complex made of the bridge, the faintest silhouette of the shore creeps into view. My eyes widen at the sight. It's almost unbelievable that we could come have come this far. The guide increases his pace as I cautiously follow suit. We near the very end of the bridges. I can smell the trees and the earth. And even though the fog, through the fog, I can almost count the remaining bridges between us and land. But between the end and us, a prowler appears. I eye the monster intently. It makes no move to leave us, so I turn to the guide instead. Here, take my lantern. Once it's scared off, we'll make our way to the shore. It shouldn't be an issue with it so close by. The guide says nothing. However, he extends his hand to accept my offer. I feel my body tense for a moment before relinquishing my light to the guide. It's not much farther. I'm sure we can make it. The guide slowly steps ahead, and the creature braces for confrontation. I stay close enough to the guide's back to keep from being left behind in the darkness. He quietly whispers, Be ready to run. Don't get left behind. He then darts forward and launches the light directly at the prowler. Shh. It makes a snarling hiss and retreats defeated back into the waters. Neither of us wastes a second looking back as we push forward. I race across the bridges, desperately trying to keep the guy's light edged figure in clear sight. I run as fast as I can possibly manage without slipping on the boards. We run across an entire way, spurred on by the shoreline rapidly approaching. Rapidly, I feel my feet plunge into dirt. I stumble forward, nearly collapsing onto the grounds while trying to catch my breath. It feels like I have come out of the long dream. We made it. After a moment of processing everything that still, that just happened and pull myself together, I rise fully to my feet and stand tall. Oh, we get a close up on the bridge this time. I turn back towards the lake. Fog drifts across empty stagnant waters as menacing as when I first laid eyes on it. I can't bear to tear my eyes from the sight. It's as though reality halts and I stare deeply at the surface. I shake away the sensation. I'm alive. I've made it across, and now I'll be able to unite the villagers and remove the brigaders. But at what cost, my mind turns over itself. I can still faintly feel wet, rigid hands on my ankle and ghostly remains of the Nixie. I know the hands are not real, but that doesn't loosen their grip. My feelings simmer beneath my own surface, fighting for dominance. Gratitude, anger, relief, guilt, hope, and sorrow are battling inside of me. They pull in so many different directions at once that I can't even think. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. My turmoil abruptly ends with the sound of the guide's voice. You can't stay. I finally rip my eyes away from the lake. I fix them and said directly on the guide. There is nothing left for you here. You must return to the world and leave this place behind. All of my words are stuck sore in my throat. I'm completely parched and my mouth is threatening to close in on itself. It fills the silence once more. I expect to never see you again. The guide looks at me harshly, almost pleading, as he gazes into my eyes. All I can offer is a slow, weak nod. I don't want this to be the way things are. I can't accept it. I'm consumed by a whirlpool of thoughts. I wasn't able to help anyone. I am entirely alone. As I continue to stare at the guide, tears well up in my eyes and threaten to spill over. He gives me no acknowledgement at all. I wipe the feeling from my face completely. I must continue on. I have no other choice left before me. On quaking legs, I march forward sullenly into the forest. I don't look back even once at the cursed lake during my retreat. However, I offer one last word. Farewell. I whisper softly, almost silently. It's a bitter farewell to all those who failed to escape the darkness and are forever lost. I can scarcely remember the rest of the trip. All I know for sure is that I did arrive in Hemera in time to help. They were grateful to see me, for it was a desperate situation indeed. The urgency meant my mind was occupied with other matters. I worked tirelessly at Hemer to aid Hemmer's own guard in forcing back brigaders, but during the moments of calm when the sun went down, I would remember the lake. The villagers were alarmed when I arrived on my own, but it did not take them long to guess what must have happened to Bamele. Soon, their suspicion of what transpired were confirmed as the leader of the community needed to be made aware of what occurred on Sinlos, in case they have lost one of their own. The townsfolk were deeply sympathetic towards me after learning that I was there to witness three souls being lost 
in the dark waters. It was a sight comfort. The guilt at my failure remains sharp, even still. I have not heard nor seen the guide since then. He will remain obscured in that realm of fog and fear, a mysterious light off in the distance that is ever out of reach of the real world. I know that I will return to my village soon, despite my own feelings. I must not let them know how this journey has affected me. I need to be strong. There is no other way. I know this one's slightly longer, but it was the end. I was not about to cut it with five minutes. So next time we'll be coming into our last, last run. Um, and it'll, that'll be it. And we'll be on to the next game after that. So I hope you'll join me for the final run, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you did, hit like, that way I know you're enjoying the content I'm making, hit subscribe, that way YouTube brings you back, here. what happens next, I won't take up any more of your time, have a good day, and I'll see y'all next time, bye!